Impossible is a word that does not exist in his vocabulary. He's a pioneer, explorer, and as he puts it, an inspirationist. Bertrand Picard is best known for becoming the first person to circumnavigate the globe in a solar-powered plane that he jointly invented. Now he's embarked on what he says is his greatest adventure yet. In fact, a thousand adventures, each showing different ways to combat climate change and spin a profit in the process. We meet Bertrand Picard in his hometown of Lausanne in Switzerland. Bertrand Picard, many thanks for joining us on Disrupted. So you're an explorer, you're an adventurer, but there seems much more to your spirit than the need, a compulsion to throw yourself into the unknown. No, it's true. It's not a compulsion. It's the desire to be disruptive. You know, an explorer is somebody who is not satisfied with the status quo, with what he sees, with, with what he has. So he wants something else. He wants something better. He wants to go seek for what could make the world better or himself better. So the unknown is, of course, a big part of it. Because if we are focused only on what we know, we lose everything else. So this is why I love to challenge all the certitudes and see how we can make things differently. OK, so then let's look through your journey a little bit, because I think a major turning point came when you travelled around the world in a hot air balloon. Then came Solar Impulse, uh, one of your biggest achievements to date. But what were you setting out to prove when it came to Solar Impulse? I wanted to prove that clean technologies and renewable energies could achieve the impossible. This is basically what I wanted to show. And the disruption of having a solar-powered airplane flying without fuel at night with solar energy. <laughs> and, and tell me, when you set about on, you know, on this amazing adventure, what was going through your mind? Did you fear failure? Were you aware of the risks? You know, all the role models I had were astronauts, explorers, divers, environmentalists, in addition to my father and my grandfather, who were great explorers. So I always wanted that type of life. Flying around the world in a balloon, at the end of last century, it was the last great possible adventure. Richard Branson was on it, Steve Fossett was on it, and I thought, why not me? So I tried, failed twice, succeeded the third time, and uh, it was the maximum that we could achieve with fuel. It was 20 days nonstop in the air, 45,000 kilometers, longest flight ever in the entire history of aviation. But we landed with 40 kilos of liquid propane, out of the 3,700 kilos I had at the start. So I thought, if I want to do better, I have to change this paradigm. I have to be disruptive again and, and do something without fuel. Because it's not the sky that is the limit. It's the fuel that is the limit. And this is how the dream of Solar Impulse came, to be able to fly around the world with no fuel at all. And the only possible energy for that at the time was solar energy. So if we look at the aviation industry now, it's being forced to reinvent itself, not only because of COVID, but because of this environmental pressure. It's the airline, commercial airline industry is hugely polluting. But do you think the solution will be hydrogen? Do you think it'll be electric? Do you think it's a possibility that it could be solar? Solar needs a big disruption if you want to fly passengers for long haul, because Solar Impulse was 72 meter wingspan, flying 45 kilometers an hour with only one person on board. And this is how we had enough energy from the sun to be able to fly. Not very practical for 200 passengers. Uh, if you want to make commercial flights today, it's going to be hybrid airplanes, it's going to be uh, hydrogen, maybe for small airplanes it's going to be batteries, uh, but solar can just be a little additional energy. But, you know, on, a, on an Airbus 380, I think if all the wings were covered with solar cells, it would only give the energy for the entertainment on board, so not for the engines. <laughs> OK, so if we look at the industry now, it's obviously on its knees because of COVID-19. Do you think when the airline industry re-emerges, 
do you think it will inevitably be fossil fuel heavy to begin with at least because of the financial pressures it's found itself in or could this be the moment where it immediately reinvents itself? No, it's the moment where the commitment is made. Airbus has committed itself to bring zero emission airplanes in 15 years. 15 years, it's possible. Aviation is so disruptive, so innovative that you can do that. If you look back in history, 15 years, it was a complete cycle for new airplanes each, each time. Every 15 years, there was a revolution. So, so you can do it, but it will take these 15 years to reach it. What we need to understand is that meanwhile, we have to act. Now, I want to talk about your Thousand Solutions initiative, which you are close to achieving. So you've now got flying around the world in a hot air balloon, in Solar Impulse, uh, under your belt. Why was it necessary for you to then take on this third really rather major challenge? Because the challenge of the 1000 solution is really what it's all about. Brightling Orbiter 3, the balloon to fly around the world, was my personal dream. Solar Impulse, flying around the world in a solar airplane, was a very symbolic endeavor. And now I'm down to earth, very practical challenge, which is to bring to the world a selection of 1000 technological solutions that can protect the environment, but in a financially profitable way. And the third trip around the world will be with this portfolio, this guide of a thousand solutions, in order to give to the governments, to the big corporations, to the institutions, all the tools they need to reach their environmental targets. Because everybody has environmental targets today, neutral in 2040, 2050, whatever but nobody has the cue how to do it. And what I want is to show that all these solutions already exist, can be in little startups, can be big corporations, multinationals, but all together, there are hundreds and hundreds of these solutions that can be used to reach more ambitious environmental policies and energy targets. So if we talk about investing in the future, and if you look at your 1,000 solutions, uh, how far are you off the 1,000 mark? And also, can you just tell us, so our viewers can, I suppose, understand what you're talking about in probably more visual yes. terms. Two solutions, for example, that have really caught your eye. Out of the 1,000 that we are selecting, we have identified and labelled now uh, 830. Uh, so we're almost there. And in these technological solutions, you have the one that are saving water, helping to purify water. You have the way to make energy with waves. You have the way to insulate buildings much better, to have smart buildings, to have heat pumps. You have the way to uh, have much cheaper solar energy, costing one fourth, one quarter of the cost of electricity made by oil, gas or coal or nuclear. Uh, you have uh, systems to make cars much cleaner. A little module that you install on your engine for $500 and it saves 20% of the fuel and cuts 80% of the toxic particles that are emitted. People are waiting for one solution that makes the miracle. No, the miracle is that there are so many solutions that each have some little result and all together you, you change the world, you change technology, you change the protection of the environment. I guess it's one thing having great ideas, it's another actually getting them out there in reality. So of all these thousand solutions, um, how many are out there? How many are being industrialised right now, ready to be taken up? 100% of these 1,000 solutions, because this is one of the criteria. We don't want to put the label of the Solar Impulse Foundation on the vague idea of a so-called genius inventor uh, that will do something in 50 years. No, all the solutions we have labelled are solutions that are either already on the market or ready to go on the market, which are clearly profitable for the industry, that are clearly creating jobs, and that are also protecting the environment. If the three criteria are met, then our group of experts is giving the label. What about in terms of return on investment then? If we look at traditional investments, how do these compare? The same or better. 
uh, we take a return on investment that is sometimes uh, six months, maximum five years. Uh, but when you have money that has now negative interest rate, it's perfect. You, you borrow money, meanwhile you gain the interest, and you invest in new infrastructures that will protect the environment. And it pays for itself. So really what, what, what I want to emphasize is the fact that we have to stop to believe that we only have the choice between degrowth that is bringing social chaos or this so-called illimited growth that is leading to an ecological disaster. No, there is a third way, which is what I call the qualitative growth, where you create jobs, you make money, by replacing what is polluting by what is protecting the environment. And today, with all the billions of euros and dollars flooding on the market for the recovery of the COVID crisis, it's the perfect moment to replace the infrastructures, to go into much more modern systems that pay for themselves. This is how we create jobs and make money. Yeah, but the, the, the irony is, I guess, from what you're saying, these solutions exist already. The environmental pressures that we live under exist already. They're, they're on our doorstep. We can see them. Why haven't they been picked up already? Because most of these solutions come from companies that are not known enough. Or sometimes they come from big companies and people believe it's only marketing. And they don't believe it is so miraculously true. And you have another phenomenon which is really bad. It's the fact that the legal framework allows to pollute. You are allowed to put as much CO2 as you want in the atmosphere and as much plastic in the ocean and as much chemicals in the soils or even in the food you eat. It is legal. So you have a lot of companies who say, what we do is allowed, it's legal, why should we change? But if you have a very ambitious regulation that is modernized, that is really based on the technologies that exist today, not on the technologies that existed 50 years ago, then you will create a need for all these new technologies to come to the market. And this will pull all the startups who are going to bloom, create jobs, and be very, very profitable. And in that sense, you will have much more winners than losers into this environmental transition. Now, you're also a psychiatrist. And given everything you've been saying to me, I'm going to ask you to go on the psychiatrist's couch because I imagine that when you have gone around the world, when you have looked at these thousand solutions, it does actually lend time for introspection of looking at what human nature is. What have you learned about yourself during this voyage that you've embarked upon? I learned to be perseverant because I was very impatient in the past when I was younger. And solar impulse was three times longer than I thought and five times more expensive. So I, I had to really work it hard to, to succeed. I learned that you should never be afraid to fail. Otherwise, you don't, you don't try anything. And you have to also learn, and this is one thing that was very new for me, the impossible is not in the reality. The impossible is in the mindset of the people who imagine that the future will be an extrapolation of the past, which is wrong. The future is always disruptive. So you need to be disruptive in order to match with the future. Bertrand, you've had so many incredible experiences in your life, in the air and on the ground. If you had advice for people watching this program, what would it be? I think it is to look for more wisdom, look for more respect, look for more compassion in life. Because whatever we do, we can have respect, we can have compassion, we can have wisdom. And I think these are values that we really have to implement into everything we do and more than that in everything we are. Bertrand Picard, many thanks. With pleasure, Isabel. That was a fantastic conversation. And I really you. enjoyed it. <laughs>